The editorial team is here to tell you about their book and to answer your questions about it. They will speak for about 30 minutes and then we will open the virtual floor to questions. Throughout the webinar, I'd like to invite you to submit your questions using the Q&A button that you will find on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. And I will read out your questions to Andrew, Aiden, and Salima. But first, I would like to introduce our speakers. Andrew Bednarski is an Egyptologist and a 19th century historian. He currently teaches at the, University, at the American University in Cairo, and he has extensive excavation experience and has lectured and published broadly on ancient Egypt and its reception in the modern world. Aidan Dotson is both an Egyptologist and a naval historian, and he has taught at the University of Bristol since 1996. He is the author of over 20 books and 300 articles covering both of his academic interests. He has lectured all over the world and he has often appeared on television. Salima Ikram has worked in Egypt, Sudan and Turkey as an archeologist. And she also is a, like, like Andrew is a professor at the American University in Cairo, a member of the American Academy for Arts and Sciences and a National Geographic Explorer her research interests include ancient Egyptian food, funerary practices, rock art, and archaeozoology. And Salima has published extensively for diverse audiences and has also appeared on television. So let's start with the basics. Tell us a little bit about how you came to write this book. Um, I guess I'll start with that because I was one of the founding members of this whole thing. Um, and what happened was that I think I'll see in 2011 or 2012, Beatrice and Janet cornered me and said, we need a book on the history of Egyptology. And I said, absolutely, absolutely. That's such a brilliant idea. We must do this. I've been thinking of this. I've been talking to my friends. And um, I got all excited and formed a little group. And um, then we had a meeting or two and then the group sort of reformatted itself and we wound up in the current conglomeration that you see with Andrew, Aidan and myself. And uh, <clears throat> this was, as I mentioned, I think in 2011 or 2012. Um, and now it is 2021. So let us say that it is a magnum opus and it took a very long time um, getting itself together, partially due to various world events, as well as to events in individuals, authors' lives, and the fact that we had several authors contributing because the whole construct of the book changed because we really, there was no, at that time, one history of Egyptology. There were lots of little articles and bits and pieces, and what I wanted to do primarily, and I think my co-editors are uh, on the same page, was to provide something that is a basic foundation for others to build upon. It's one of these, in a way, I will say, old fashioned kind of works where we have names, dates and events because it's a lot of attempt at trying to put together a bunch of primary evidence that people can then use to build upon, extrapolate from, and come up with a larger, bigger, better, or more ideas. And what we also wanted to do was not just do sort of, this is who taught here, this is what they did, etc., but also show how ancient Egypt really played a very intrinsic part, sporadically, in the world culture. And at different points, it became integrated into furniture, film, fashion, dancing, local parlance, um, and, and all kinds of popular culture. And I think we wanted to sort of weave this story from different parts of the world together to show how ancient Egypt, as well as its study, whether formal or informal, has really contributed to making us what, who and what we are today. Thanks. Okay, so what were some of the particular challenges that you faced in putting this book together over those your gestation? Well, as Salima says, we are talking about multiple authors. In fact, we're talking to like 22 different authors to bring the whole thing together, which has produced, uh, as she said, a magnum opus of something like 600 pages. 
And the biggest challenge for me, because I was the one who sort of took on a lot of the, what I might call the practical um, dealing with the text, was actually to try and produce a book rather than a collection of articles. Mm -hmm. Because there are, you know, the, the writing of this kind of textbook by multiple authors is quite common nowadays. But often when you read them, you find that there's lack of coherence. You find some people are contradicting each other, spelling things differently. So a major issue is that it was purely the practical one of trying to produce something which will read as a book rather than a collection of essays, which was an interesting thing to do because bearing in mind that the 22 authors are each dealing with their own uh, national national history effect or, or a national history. So many of them had English as a second language. So there was a question in some cases of actually um, translating the, their original um, text into English to start with. Others who have got really good written English, however, it's not quite idiomatic English. So there was a whole question about the practical thing of trying to get it all to read in a uniform kind of English. Another issue um, came about over what was going to be in each chapter, because although we had a vision, which Salima um, has talked about there, about it being sort of all aspects of the way that ancient Egypt and its study have um, impinged, um, there are different authors had different views on that. We did actually produce a model chapter at the outset, which covered, which was an example, in effect, it was this chapter I wrote on, 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 the, on the British Isles, to give an idea of the range of things, both from popular reception through to hardline university stuff to try and get that, and had to present that to try and persuade the, get the authors to try and follow that pattern, which we had uh, mixed, mixed success on. Um, and readers will see that some some parts of the book do follow that original, the, the plan, but there are a few which go slightly off piste, for example. Um, and another issue was also due to the rather messy history of Europe during the 19th, early 20th centuries, because we had, because of particularly the, the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire meant that Poland was had its had a chapter of its own, but also had an involvement in the Austro-Hungarian chapter. And there were bits of negotiation I had to do about removing paragraphs from one author's chapter and moving into another's or rewriting bits, just so we didn't have that kind of weirdness of having the same um, event and individuals introduced twice slightly differently. So it was a very interesting um, experience to try and do that. And I think it sort of highlights not only what, the, what we were doing, but also the difficulties in writing that kind of multi-author work. We hope, we, we've, as far as we possibly can, we've tried to make sure there's a single voice through it, that it, is, it does actually read, but we'll have to await the, uh, the reviewer's um, decision, um, verdict and verdict on that. Well, from what right. I've read, I think you've done a great job. It really does oh, read. Let me hear. <laughs> if, if I can expand a little bit on uh, on some of the challenges that Aiden put forward, you know, for some of the sections of the book, this is uh, a first stab at a history of Egyptology in, in that part of the world. So I think another challenge is sort of access to sources um, that the scholars had to deal with. Uh, you know, there's, there's been a fair bit written about different characters and different events uh, in the history of British Egyptology and French Egyptology and German Egyptology. There really hasn't been much on Japanese Egyptology, for example. So, you know, that, that was another challenge for many of the authors to try and produce works that are on par with the other chapters that are being produced when in fact they're taking a first stab at this disciplinary history for their region. In addition to the challenges of, you know, every scholar would have different access to different types of resources. So. Well, well, well done on Aiden for making sure that this all sort of reads as, uh, you know, as a uniform voice. Uh, could you tell us all a bit about your overall approach to the topic? Why did you feel that it was important to, uh, to structure this book chronologically? Yeah, uh, I mean, th there are many different ways that you can approach the history of Egyptology. Um, 
chronologically, I think was just uh, a default that, that we came to. We thought it was important to try and, and start with uh, 1831, when the first chair of, of archaeology is uh, created and filled by Jean-Francois Champollion, which is, you know, kind of the first chair of Egyptology that really comes into existence because of Champollion's focus. And then we knew we didn't want to get into anything beyond the 1970s, because it, it feels a bit too much like uh, current events, you know, particularly that the people that we would be writing about are still some of them active in the field. So we knew that that was sort of the temporal period that we wanted to deal with. Uh, and then I, I think it just made sense to the three of us to progress onwards like that. Uh, I, I've also felt like there's, you know, when you read other, other histories of Egyptology, a lot of the time they'll start with uh, classical interest uh, in ancient Egypt. So Greek and Roman travelers and writers who are interested, and then there'll be a progression into inevitably the European medieval period and the European Renaissance. Um, you know, to my mind, while all of that, that interest in and research on ancient Egyptian civilization from those periods is important and absolutely informs modern scholarship to varying degrees, to my mind, that, that's very different from, from Egyptology as it's formalized by institutions in the early, early 19th century, mid 19th century onwards, which is, you know, modern Egyptology really owes itself to those, uh, those phenomena that happened within that, that, that earlier period. So. And we, and we, sort of, we do briefly talk about it, but very much call it the prehistory of Egyptology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, Egyptology as a as an academic thing, really, the eighteen thirties onwards onwards. And there are also so many books and articles that already deal with the prehistory that there was really no need to beat a dead horse. Um, and it is more interesting to proceed forward, I think, and 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 to try and understand how these things work. Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, I hope in the future, though, that we could, if we ever change things we would add a few more um, places such as South Africa and a few other countries which went by the by because we already had as Aidan mentioned a rather over full stable. Mm -hmm. There was another little thing was as far as because it was internet all the various nations was there were some funny games deciding what order to place them in because one didn't, did, didn't really want to necessarily do alphabetical. Or, so eventually you effectively done them um, geographically sort of spiraling out from Egypt. Because we took the view that Egypt had to be the first national chapter. There was the, you know, there's no other. And then from there, we then sort of drifted across to France and then went, then sort of basically spiraled through Europe and around the world. So hope, so there was no, so apart from Egypt being made very specifically the premier chapter, hopefully every, all the other order, ordering was sufficiently random that nobody can feel that we were making judgment calls mm -hmm. on, sort of, on which country was more important than the other. Except that we do it, of course, Egypt, I think has to be there as the most important of the whole lot. <laughs> of course, it must. So in putting together a very large reference volume like this one, one always learns some, some new and sometimes surprising information. Uh, could you give us an example or two of some of the new insights that you learned in the process of editing this book? I mean, so, so for me, there was uh, a level of nuance that, that was added to well-known people, well-known um, efforts in, in, in Egyptology. Uh, you know, when. When I, when I first started reading about the history of Egyptology, I, I had this sort of thumbnail impression that, uh, you know, France and Germany were investing at a, at a, at a state level uh, in the exploration of, of Egypt, and as opposed to Britain, which is very much a sort of privately funded venture. Uh, and so I was really pleased when I was reading Philippe Mintepo's chapter on, on France, for example, that he talks about the role of, of learned societies uh, in, in France as well, that are privately funding excavations, you know, at, at the same time. So for me, there were, there were fun little nuances like that, that I, I could sort of layer onto my, my understanding already of, of how work was being done at different points in time. And also, I think one thing which came to me was the number of people who we sort of lot, who we've have been lost, um, literally in some cases. Uh, there was one, it was, it was a Pole who was clearly an absolute genius Unfortunately, he died of TB in his 20s, having carried out a couple of major excavations. And he clearly would have been something 
had it not been for that. So, and of course, and, and, and that was one of these great things about having the, the, the specific chapters on countries who generally don't get into the spotlight was actually seeing some of the individuals from there. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, though, the other, if I'm looking at the other end of the telescope is the way that certain in certain other individuals keep cropping up in almost every <laughs> national chapter, particularly yeah. something like Adolf Ehrmann um, in Berlin, because he seems to have taught pretty well all the key figures um, around around Europe at that time. Um, and so there are sort of there are certain sort of, of circles of individuals who are who are um, united by a common teacher. And I think that helped under, underline that although we were dealing with things on a national basis, as far as the structure of the book was concerned, there were lots of transnational links in yeah. them. And that was, so going back to what I was saying earlier on about the practical editing of the thing, it was, try, it was doing the cross references to those transnational links which took a hell of a long time during the, um, the latter parts of the editorial process to actually make sure that a, that a reader on page you know, 590 can actually find their way back to when certain person is mentioned in the first chapter or something like that. So that's where, we, again, we hope that there's enough cross references in the thing so it makes it quite easy for people to find those links. And hopefully, and as, as both um, Drew and Slimmer have said, hopefully this book is a tool which will allow future researchers to be able to pick out some of those links and possibly explore those in more detail with the with with the basic material we've put together as to make that um, make that possible. And I think what was also interesting, I mean, as, as building on what both Aidan and Andrew said, um, we sort of saw schools of thought being identified, and you could see how entire continents were being brainwashed by the same teacher and um, maybe not brainwashed but you know you learn from someone you pass it on and you can yeah. see how the foundations of a certain way of looking or thinking or expressing yourself are established and it's very useful to be able to actually look at it objectively so that when you are looking at the discipline it suddenly crystallizes these moments and these individuals and these trains the strains of thought and also for me, um, it was really fun because there were, we always talk about Salim Hassan and Ahmed Fakhri, but we could bring to the fore other people. And what's been great is also because in a way that this has been such a long-term project, we've seen the discipline of the history of Egyptology grow. And so in the beginning, you know, there were a few people doing it. And by now it's sort of burgeoned. And also over here in Egypt, we have now access to so many more archives and so many more people are crawling out of the woodwork for good or for ill, that it's really changing our perception as to how things were done and who was important and who actually had power. So in fact, some of this um, construct of um, this dialogue about uh, colonialist or post-colonialist whatever can be challenged based on what we're finding out now so I think um, there's a bit of empowerment going on now with some of the new material that we are unearthing which is very delightful to me. I mean that, that's the strength really of uh, such a large collaboration as difficult as as it was to bring so many people together and, and produce something coherent but I mean you know I myself once upon a time, I thought I knew something about the history of Egyptology, but I would not be able to deal with Russian archives. I would not be able to deal with Japanese material, uh, you know, so that is, a, and, and it's perfectly in keeping with, you know, the, the transnational nature of Egyptology as well. So that, that is very encouraging to see, as Salimo and, and Aiden have been talking about, you know, these different sources and these different perspectives that are now coming to the fore that we hope will be a launching pad for, for future avenues of research. Well, staying with this theme, um, I'd be interested in your insights regarding the di different approaches to scholarship from these different national traditions. I know we get all of the scholars, you know, they come, as you said, come from a different point of view. And how did you manage to deal with that and kind of amalgamate it in some whole that was not going to be confusing to your readers? I think, well, bear, bear in mind that because we were doing standalone chapters for each of the nations, 
that sort of that, that made itself very very clear in the actual in the actual narrative itself. Uh, and certainly, when I was as I guess as Drew's already mentioned, uh, the the British approach has, has always been very very laissez faire, at marked contrast to Germany, where it's been very much Egyptology and, and most scholarship was managed centrally, and that you know, university professors in Germany. Um, you know, were, were state appointed and effectively civil servants in marked contrast to what you're finding in, in, find in the UK. So it was looking at this again, so having looked across the whole thing, you've got the model, the most we might call the British model of pretty well everything is done um, as a result of private donation. The, the first British um, professor of Egyptology is funded from the will of a novelist. Uh, um, the, first, the, the main excavating body is, is founded by the same individual. Yet in Germany, you've got like, very much more state-oriented um, stuff. And then in the middle, you've got all kinds of mixtures of these things, part of which come from what the academic tradition is in that particular country. And the, Mer and the United States is particularly fascinating because you've got a collision almost of the German style of things, which is how... American universities all kick, kicked off, and then as time goes by, more the more um, sort of bottom up, the privately funded approaches in there. So, it, I think it's something which, again, a bit of work which could come out of our book is actually a much more in depth look at that particular aspect of how scholarship has been is managed um, across the uh, across the, across the piece. So, I think we've so once again, I think we've we've, we've put we've stated what's going on in individual countries, but then I think it's safe for, enough, for, for further scholars, hopefully to perhaps pick up some of those, um, those links and try and look at the overall model of Egyptological scholarship. Good, thank you. Um, finally, how will your book contribute to our understanding of the study of ancient Egypt? <laughs> <laughs> Greatly, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I think that's like, we, I think we're providing hopefully the the the, the, the uh, a full narrative of what, who did what to whom and when, which has been lacking thus far across the whole piece. Yeah, a point of departure is what I is what I hope for. You know, um, for, for new avenues of research, uh, and, and that was really the point of the book to produce this sort of resource foundational starting point. And yeah, that's my last question. Why is your book timely and how does it set the stage for future research? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've rather, we've, we've rather sort of pre, uh, preempted, preempted the question, really. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, do, I do think it's timely. I mean, as, as Salima had mentioned, when, when this idea was percolating, there were groups of people who were coming together um, to collaborate uh, on their own, their own perceptions of, of what it meant to be an Egyptologist. Um, you know, and, and, and now all these many years later, that group has grown and, and, and what they're Huge producing. Thing. Yeah, and what they're producing is, is incredibly interesting and incredibly relevant. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that now this resource can actually be capitalized on by that group of scholars uh, with what they're producing. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things I like is that we, we start this book trying to offer a definition of what Egyptology is. And, and that's not something that traditionally when you read about the history of Egyptology, traditionally you find. And, you know, we felt it was important to try and define the subject matter before you, you really get into it. Um, so ho hopefully that in itself will also lead to a bit because Egyptologists don't have a formal agreement on what it means to be an Egyptologist or even how to do Egyptology at times. Yeah. And that in fact was a very interesting point because that engendered a lot of discussion, sure. fairly heated. Um, <laughs> uh, and of course, because traditionally it's been philology versus material culture archaeology. Um, and I always thought, maybe because of my silsila, my background of coming to this, is that Egyptology is about the ancient Egyptians using anything, any tool, any bit of evidence that would tell us about them. Um, and so I have been very lucky to have studied with people who in fact have encouraged that. And I think a lot of what happens with Egyptology depends on whom you have studied with and what they let you do and what they encourage you to do. And it's interesting because, you know, you think of fields in a way as that of this, well, until recently one thought of them as 
monoliths, but so much of is is what happens is up to chance and personalities. And also reading all of the chapters, um, one is once again struck again and again by how much individuals do actually shape history. Mm. There was just one further thing about sort of about the timeliness is the one thing which, which Drew and I have been involved with is, is a number of uh, seminars to do with the with the history of Israelite, but integrating into history of science. There was a conference uh, a couple of years ago where one of our the two of us and also one of one uh, at least one of the, two of the authors were heavily involved with, and it was at the first time history of Egyptology had been brought into a history of science conference, as far as we can tell. And I think that's also part of it is that having this resource available aids that integration of the study of the ancient world, I think, into, into the broader history of, um, of knowledge. So you know, I think, yeah. I think we, there's, there's a lot going on at the moment. And I think we've seen, you know, I think we were ahead of the, ahead of the game in actually put it, starting to put this thing together. And it's time it's coming out is quite timely in the context of what's going on um, more broadly in the sort of study of the history of science. I mean, for me, you know, the history of Egyptology is a lens through which um, you can view past past events and pa past political phenomena. Um, so, I mean, that that that's one of my own personal interests in it. To, you know, to, to to tie it to or to look at different events that have, that have happened uh, and and to see the repercussions as they occurred in in scholarly fields like Egyptology. That was the ongoing. Thank you, thank you. So we have um, some questions coming in. I see that Salima has also been typing some um, responses. But we have our first question, which is, is there any archeological evidence of jail or prison or detention systems in the history of ancient Egypt? Absolutely. Um, from the 19th century onward, depending on what you did, if you dug illegally or if you stole artifacts, this was late, no, later 19th century, um, we did in Egypt have um, punishments that were part listed in the official record. So uh, whether people were jailed or whether they were fined, um, we do have a consistent set of um, things that you are not supposed to do, which have become increasingly strict as time has gone by. And there's a second question, which is, um, what are, were the religious beliefs and how did they change between the middle um, and the recent kingdoms that made the kings of the 18th dynasty close to the human nature and to fight and even be killed with their army? Rather beyond the scope of our work, because we're very much, very much our book is between 1831 AD and 1976 AD, rather than dealing with um, the history of ancient the history of ancient, ancient Egypt itself. It's history of the investigation of Egypt that the that the uh, the book is all about. And I think the answer to the question which has been posed requires a number of books. <laughs> It's a great answer. We have another question. Um, when you were comparing the different approaches to Egyptology, that is, let's say, state-sponsored compared with private ad hoc research, did you arrive at any insights about which approach was most successful in different areas or disciplines? I think it depends how you define success um, to begin with. I suppose, I suppose in, in some ways you could say which is the method which produced, produces the most money for because ultimately, actually, without money, um, you know, much as one would like to say it's all you know, that, that money isn't the key thing, it often is. So uh, you could say it's a question of whether or not which, in a given particular a given moment, which produced the most funding. Again, look at wearing my sort of hat as historian of, of British Egyptology, given that the state was providing zero funding during the 19th century, private funding had to be better because there wasn't anything else. And I mean, in the way, if you start looking at what was produced, um, it is quite interesting because we do really have a lot coming out of Britain, surprisingly, with the series of publications that we see from excavations, despite the fact that it was not really state sponsored, whereas particularly in France and Germany, it was very much so with a larger budget. Um, so it's interesting to see, but the British have always muddled on in a particular way. 
I think it's because the British British authorities have always been philistines as far as funding anything to do with the arts is concerned. Uh, and well, then, now, yeah. Um, so that was yes, and that's and that can take continue, continues to be that. But also, I suppose, from the point of view of the broader reception of the of the subject, the fact that excavating bodies like the Reparation Society had to get private funding, and actually, we're talking not sort of, not sort of we're talking about millionaires. We're talking about sort of individuals paying a few a few a few pounds a year. That actually widened the popular interest in the subject because to, because you had to go out on you know go out give lectures in village halls and so on to try and raise money. So that meant that the idea of ancient Egypt and its research became much much more widespread in an organic kind of way. Uh, and if you look today, there are literally dozens of small of local Egyptology societies in the UK. Um, mm -hmm which I think isn't something you find in any other country. I think it ultimately goes back to that model of very much bottom up. Yeah, and I mean, to, to, to build on, on what's been said about the need for money and the need for funding, it's great to have large government dollars going into a project, but I mean, when large government dollars tend to go into a project, it also tends to suck all the oxygen out of the room uh, and, and minimizes opportunities for other people to explore you know, different different avenues of research. You know, I think very much of, of Napoleon Bonaparte, the, the, the work that came out of his, um, his 1798 invasion, the Description de l'Egypte, I mean, it, it takes 30 years to produce. Now, granted, that's a little bit before the area that we're looking at with this book, but you know, that is the elephant in the room, for example, that is the quintessential huge government project that, that's taking place. And it must have been very difficult at times for other scholars with other interests who maybe wanted to do different things to, to find funding and find the resources, even humans, and then carry on with the work that they wanted to do. So, okay, so we have a question. Um, did the ancient Egyptian studies study Egyptology in a similar way that we do today? And if not, how did they do it? Uh. I'll just kick off. I think the thing to bear in mind is that ancient Egypt lasts 3,000 years. So that for, for somebody who lived around Tadun Khamun's time, for example, the pyramids were real ancient monuments. And we certainly know that, they, that tourists went round visiting these things. Um, we've got graffiti and so on. So there was clear an interest in the past. But whether one can actually call it sort of what we would call Archaeology is another, is another, is another, is another thing. Uh, there's a, a, an Egyptian print, or even historical research. I yeah, mean, yeah but, it's not similar to what we do now. Yeah, but on the other hand, there is what's quite interesting when you look at some of the sort of king lists and so on, which produced. They must have right. been research carried out to get to those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and exactly how what they had to work with, and you, and it's really quite. You, know, you there are glimpses of documents which once existed no longer exist which they must have worked on or possibly two separate sets of research which a later researcher is desperately trying to reconcile to apparently irreconcilable reconstructions so there are they clearly had there clearly was some kind of historical research going on but all but we, we see only a few tiny fragments of the results of that and those give us perhaps some vague feeling of what they might have had to work with. Um, it, that, that, that is really quite a fascinating topic in its own right. Um, during your research, did you see many women pursuing a career in Egyptology, especially in the early period of Egyptology? Um, actually, there were far more than one would have supposed. Um, however, I have to say that certainly in Britain, and the US in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, it was a field that was dominated by men. And it is very interesting to see that now when one goes to conferences, <laughs> all those XY chromosomes are not very well represented, <laughs> but they're totally taken over by women. Um, but it better. Is, what the, well, I, I didn't want to say that because I didn't want you and Aiden to feel bad. Um, but um, certainly it, it is, you know, you think, oh, there was no woman doing this, that and the other. But in fact, there were quite a few women who were doing things in the early years across the board. And I mean, look in Britain, it was founded 
the, the Peak Tree Chair was founded by a woman. The funding came from a woman for a lot of the early Egyptology. Um, and you see that also in a lot of Eastern Europe in particular, which was some very fine examples of scholars who did kick-ass work. Um, and I'm very glad that in fact, in this book, they are brought to the forefront and are celebrated because otherwise people don't really know about them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's quite nice to change this received wisdom that it was all male dominated. Um, so I think that we have learned through this book that there were a lot more women. Um, and also, I mean, in Egypt, uh, not initially, but then there were women who actually said, we want to study Egyptology, what is this rubbish? And you're going to let us have this thing. And so there were quite vociferous women who made sure that they could go to Cairo University and study Egyptology. And then subsequently, I've been quite fortunate to be taught by someone who is not that early because she's not that old. <laughs> but but um, by the Haeckel, who did, you know, she was the first um, female Egyptian archaeologist to work in, well, she's a philologist, but she was still doing diggy stuff in Nubia. Um, so it, it is interesting to have all of these things brought to the forefront. And so we're busting some myths with this book. Well, well done. <laughs> um, let's see, there's another question. Can one say when the early international conferences on Egyptology, Egyptology took place, who was involved and what fines or issues or problems were on the agenda? I think the, yeah. I think the very, the, the earliest conferences and actually right the way through to 1976, Egyptology was within what was then called Oriental Studies. Mm -hmm. So we have congresses of Oriental Studies starting in the late 19th century, which have had various sort of various themes, various strands and so on. But during that time, that's it. The, the Egyptological com component of these tended to be pretty well around texts because that kind of Oriental Studies which embraced the study of Arabic, Turkish, and all these other things, not just simply ancient things. So they tended to be quite um, uh, philologically um, focused. Although clearly there was, the material culture was in there as well. Um, and they all seem to have been quite a good, uh, people had quite a good time. There is a, um, it, there was it was one I think which was in Sweden and Norway where the, where the, where the, where the contemporary press had a field day noting how little time was spent in lecture rooms having papers and how much time was spent having banquets parties and things like that um, which, that, which is uh, not what happens at academic conferences now today at all no no we never no. actually exchange ideas in in social gatherings it's all about lectures of a very Serious and dry nature, but uh, but but yes, yeah, so no. The, the conferences have been going on almost since the since sort of formal study of ancient Egypt got going. So I think mid mid nineteenth century kicked the first ones off, and it's only when you get to the nineteen seventies when all the various disciplines which are which were brigaded under these congresses of Orientalists realized actually you can't fit them all in the same you know all them in the same building and at that point. The, you know, the, the Mesopotamian specialists go in one direction, Persian specialists, Egyptologists and so on. But 76 is when all that happens. And I say that's when the, uh, the, the first Congress of Egyptologists as a, as a standalone um, entity is where our core um, narrative finishes off. Which as also was mentioned, it was mentioned, it was when the three of us as um, editors were still at, um, at high school or even grade school. So it was a point where we, we were no longer, you know, it was before we were involved actually you know, actively in the subject, which hopefully led, leads to a level of, 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 of uh, being able to stand back and watch this as real history rather than worrying about the individuals who are still, that might still be active. So did, uh, during when you did the research on the book, did you find that there were differences in attitudes towards ancient Egypt uh, regarding religious beliefs, and especially the religious beliefs of the archaeologists from the different countries participating in the field? I don't think it was so much from the different countries as it depended on the individual archaeologist, and sometimes a little bit the temper of the times. But I don't think this was religion influencing uh, a, a sort of 
geographical areas mindset. So I think it was much more of whomever. And obviously, as we know, a lot of the initial work on ancient Egypt was carried out by people who had a biblical scholarship mindset. Um, but that quickly, once people engaged with the magnificent ancient Egyptians, in many cases flew out of the window. And we did have also several reverends and, and uh, abbés who were working here, who were digging and as well as doing translations. And it is quite interesting when you read their work, you'd expect it to have much more of a religious overtone, but it doesn't in many instances. And in fact, I think in some cases, it's the non-men of the cloth or people of the cloth who come up with a heavier religious slant than the people of the cloth who tend to often present things in a far more scientific light. But I don't know what my co-editors think of my impressions on this. I think, I mean, I, I'll get back to what, what you were saying. That I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, I think I understand who you're speaking of. Very hard to generalize, you know, with such a, a large, large territories and the number of people who are looking on it. And there are certainly a number of different uh, pressures on people when they're researching, including the religious environment from which they're coming, their own personal views, sometimes dealing with religion. Um, I'm thinking as well of um, countries that were, were following uh, a communist system of government as well, you know, that when researchers wanna get permission to go out and work, their research has to fit the narrative of the ideology of the funding body. That's uh, perhaps a very- Funding bodies are the key. Mm -hmm. you know, of, of explaining it. And so, you know, you, you, you have uh, people who had very specific religious views who would also be funding research. And, and so, you know, of course, the, the narrative that you put forward to justify your starting point for research has to tie into the funding bodies and the people who are interested in addition to whatever personal interests you yourself might have and the communities from which you're coming. So it's it's a really difficult knot to unpick um, at times to figure out what somebody absolutely believed, what things they felt they needed to say in order to get the funding and the permission to do the work, what things people felt they needed to say to make their research when they're publishing their results palatable. Um, it, it's a tough question to, to answer. I think, I think actually in some ways it's political ideology that matters more than religion. It, the, the times when you really do see the results skewed or work aimed at partic proving particular things, it's not so much to do with people who've got um, a religious, it's totalitarian, you know, in national socialism, state communism and so on. That's where you find the, there, there are real impacts on what you're allowed to say, what conclusions you're allowed to reach. Um, and so there's some quite interesting case studies in the um, in, in, in the book to do with, most obviously Nazi Germany and Soviet Union, but also particularly what's going on in Czechoslovakia, for example. So there's, so I think that's really where it's, it's actually, ideo rather than saying religion, it's ideology in general, which is, which is sometimes an issue. And also actually from the point of view of religion, uh, certainly in, in, in Britain, it was actually used as a, it's a fundraising tool because, again, as, as we've said, in 19th century particularly, all funding for excavation had to be raised privately. And if you could say we might find somewhere mentioned in the Bible, you're going to possibly get people like uh, sort of um, uh, that's uh, good. Reverends may may well may well deep into their pockets if they think they're contributing to finding one of the, a biblical site. So there was some. I think it was there was a certain amount of cynicism. I think involved in some of these appeals for appeals for money. That you know, if you could just put some, even though you had no expectation of finding anything to do with the Bible, you could if you could just sort of drop the odd biblical reference, you might well get a couple of checks or money put into the bucket, which you wouldn't otherwise do. So there's, so I think it's so much sort of as religious belief by the people who are doing the digging, but the belief, but possible beliefs of the people who might be giving you some money. Or am I being too cynical there? <laughs> Not at all, not at all. Um, we have a question. How have issues of reconciliation informed or complicated the work, the relationships, and the outreach of Egyptology? 
sorry, I didn't quite hear my question. Uh, how have issues of repatriation informed or complicated the work and the relationships and outreach of Egyptology? I think that the issues of repatriation largely, apart from one person's very important head, uh, are outside the scope of our book's time frame. Um, Co-editors? Yeah, I think the issue that they, 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 the, the one which you mentioned, of course, is, is, um, is the head of Nefertiti in, in Berlin. The question of sort of the legality of some of these, because in, in certain, certainly in certain bits of work were on the, on the on the boundaries of legality, even in the terms of in terms of the period. But indeed, the 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 question that a lot of the questions about whether things should or should not be repatriated. There's a general agreement that stuff which left Egypt before about 1970 is is is, is in, a, in a genre of, of its own. Um, it's after 1970 that one has to be is, is much more um, has to be much more com um, conscious of whether thing what actually happened with things because there was a complete ban on the export of material from, from Egypt to 19, 1983. So that is a 1983 is, is the is the year which everybody's minds are focused on. Anything which is acquired after 83 we have to be very very careful about its its provenance and we probably we are aware for quite a lot of forge of forged provenances things you know, with, with apparently export certificates dated before 1983, which actually were dug up last year. So there's some real major things. And that, I think, is a, that is a, 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 compl a completely separate topic, which deserve, which needs, um, I think, uh, needs public, uh, needs study and, uh, and publication. Uh, we have another question about um, regarding surprises when, as you were doing the research for this book. Any, could you give us some, some examples or an example? Yes, an 1864 picture of samurais in front of the Giza pyramids. Oh my God, I thought that was, that was wonderful. Thank, thank you, Nozomu Kawai and uh, Professor Jiro Kondo. Thank you for that picture, that's awesome. Mm. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Yeah. I think there was all sorts of other little, little sort of little, little surprises, I suppose. But I think that is the most sort of visual of them, anyway. <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry, I, I, pro I probably nipped the question in the bud. You were probably about to answer with a much more scholarly and erudite, you know, surprise that came your way. And I, I'm like, we've got samurai in front of the, the pyramids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apologies. I think we can be like Roald Dahl. Expect the unexpected. No. <laughs> Right, I think we've run through the questions now. Um, so anything else that you'd like to tell us about the book? Yeah, it, it's an ongoing dialogue, we hope, right? Uh, as as my, my two partners in crime have, have put forward, right? This was really meant to be a foundation uh, for other avenues of research or ongoing, a resource for ongoing areas of research. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where it may take people and what might become of it. Yeah, I mean, I think it was very nice. It was extraordinarily interesting to read through what everyone had to say. And it certainly changed my understanding of what went on um, and refined it. And I think that when one looks at what people do today, I look at it now in a slightly different way because I'm trying to figure out what are the, what is the impetus behind this particular trajectory, this route. Because of course, we like to think of academic research as being this pure thing, except it's not. So much of what happened is created due to funding or governmental ideas or people's personal agendas um, or a desire to succeed and make a name for yourself. So you, you know, find something that's gonna get you in the forefront, which is particularly true today because I think that with the way social media and the way um, governments are looking at the humanities in particular, um, we are trying harder and harder to make ourselves relevant or high profile. And yeah. it's interesting to see how so much of what a discipline does or where it goes depends on these things. Because I mean, I got into this 
not this book, but I got into Egyptology because I loved the ancient Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something one has to remind oneself about, to hold true, to think that that's what I'm doing it for and not all the other noise, but it's very difficult. And especially I feel for my students and younger scholars today, you can't always hold to the truth in you because if you want to succeed, you might have to use those buzzwords and follow a certain trajectory because that's what's cool and upcoming. Um, and it, it's a sad thing that one can't have a great, you know, always hold to a greater truth, which is very naive of me, I know, Beatrice. I know it's naive. But I like to think that, you know, we can hang out for the ancient Egyptians and let them have a voice in the end. Aidan, any final thoughts from you? And I think actually just what you're saying there, I hope that actually in, the, in our book, there are some cautionary tales against that kind of sort of towing the line. Um, you know, com there are certainly comments, uh, we're talking about Eastern Europe after the Second World War, how you, were ha you really had to put some kind of quote from Lenin or Marx in your first paragraph, otherwise you weren't going to get published. And in fact, you know, but, you know, there, there's, it, it's, nowadays there are, there are certain things where sort of, I'm not going to call them short fads, but there are certain things where you know, to, to get a grant, you've got to make sure it's, it's, the, it's the latest buzzwords are being used or, or, a, or a particular theory which happens to be cool at the moment. Um, and as, you know, and as, co as our colleagues in Eastern Europe, they sort of took the view that, um, well, I guess because Henri IV was so saying that Paris was worth a mass when he became King of France. I think that a lot of scholars in, in, in Eastern Europe took the view that a bit of Lenin was worth was worth their publication or their grant. And I think there are scholars today who probably have to say that, that kowtowing to the latest fad is probably necessary just to keep going. Um, so there's a so it's a pity that the, the purity of scholarship, pure, much as one would like to think of a purity of scholarship, um, yeah. I don't think it's ever really yeah. been there. Everybody has to sort of to, to bend to the prevailing wind on occasion. But one hopes that if you do have to do that, at least you remain, at least in you know, your own heart, true to yourself. And I think looking at some of the people who that we, are in our book, they did that. There are others who completely sold their souls to the devil. Um, but uh, so there's so there, there are angels and devils in the uh, in the uh, in the book. And quite nothing nothing outside what we know about human history over time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there is one more question here, and it says, um, "Were there arrangements between the Ottomans?" Oh, I just lost it. Oh, or did you just answer that, Sal Salima? Oh dear, I'm sorry, I'd answered it a while ago, but I've got bad internet, so it took a long time for it to go through. Okay, I think, and then- All by Nancy Novak, I think. And then there, did you answer the question about the index? And no, I did not. Okay, there, there was a question about um, in the index, I did not see Jean Guayot listed, were only a few Egyptologists selected for each country. Well, I mean, this, this was left to the contributing uh, authors, right? So we- yeah. We put out a model and then it, it was up to the individual authors who are writing that chapter to decide who to include and, and who not to include. Um, so I, I think that might be one answer, Aiden. Yeah, well, I know some, some people took a much more broad brush to, to looking, uh -huh. at, looking at sort of themes and so on. Others mm -hmm. went down a very heavily biographical route. So mm -hmm. some of the chapters are quite rich in a number of people who are, in, who are mentioned by name. Others only sort of mention some of these sort of more the highlights. It also depends on how many Egyptologists there actually were in a given country. Uh, in certain countries, almost everybody who ever could call themselves an Egyptologist is mentioned by name because there weren't that many of them. But then when you get to sort of the um, places like the UK, um, of the states, France and Germany, clearly it has to be a selection of individuals. But again, the sort of people, now certain certain authors very much stuck to the the great the professors. Others also embraced the um, more the, some of the enthusiasts and so on. But again, that probably also links in with what we were talking about earlier on about how some of the places are very state oriented, and therefore the only people who really had any impact 
were the professor was your you know your your professors whereas in other countries it was the enthusiasts who were setting the agenda so it, it really does vary um, I also think that people who died after the end date of our book were not put in to the index um, because it was only people who died for the 70s I think who got to be put in for the most part um, I mean, if we were going, because I think we did a little bit of adjustment and I think that's the rule we used. And uh, uh, Dr. Yoyot was someone who was dearly loved by Aidan and myself and um, lunched with and we met him. But I, I think that we didn't put him in because of the fact that he was not pre the 70s in his or, or or rather the author of the French chapter, because it wasn't down well, to... They, no, the, the French chapter didn't put him in, but I think we did some remedial stuff for someone or two others, and therefore he didn't get in. Um, okay. Not that it's... And, and people should remember, if someone is not in the index, it is not meant as disrespect on any level. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that we're just about wrapped up. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out uh, this weekend to make such a wonderful presentation and let the world know a little bit more about your book and also to thank you for pulling together this extraordinary work of scholarship. I think it's going to be one of those classics that goes on and on and on that, that people will constantly be referring to. You've been- Thank you for the opportunity to, to put that work together. Thank you. thank you, Beatrice, for being the person who made it all happen. Yeah. And thank you, Aiden and Salima. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to all of our fabulous authors. That's right. Yes, that, that's the important point is we only wrote a, a tiny proportion of the words. The yeah. vast majority of those words are written by our authors covering the world. And also, also the world of, which we hadn't even mentioned, there's even a chapter on the world of cinema, which is another... Yeah another country in many ways, as far as the um, dissemination of ancient Egypt is concerned. So, so very many thanks to all those, all those authors who put their effort in and, you know, and, and had to engage with, with, with people like me, telling them could they change things and, uh, and so on and so forth. So that, those are the people who really, we merely were, we were facilitators and wrote bits and pieces. All these other people are responsible for the majority of those 600 pages. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.